This video tells the story of a great and amazing caribou hunting trip to northern Alaska in 2009. Paul Shetty, Roger Summers, and Brent Anderson join Northern Air Trophy Outfitters to pursue Alaska's western Arctic caribou herd. Two old friendships and a new one in the making, an adventure that would consume our thoughts and dreams for many weeks and years to come. Starting in Kotzebue, Alaska, we were flown to the northern end of the Brooks Range Mountains, the northernmost mountain range in the world. We camped and hunted at the west end of Feniac Lake. I thought it might be helpful to do a little bit of a uh, geography lesson on Alaska uh, so you could understand exactly where we were, how far we were up, and how far we were from civilization. Okay, so this is Alaska. Uh, Anchorage is located right down here. Um, this right here is the Kenai Peninsula. This over here is the Alaska Peninsula. Down in this area is Dutch Harbor, of course, where uh, 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 great, uh, Deadliest Catch is filmed. <clears throat> Bristol Bay, this is where a lot of the uh, crab fishing is done and uh, important salmon fishing uh, that supplies a, a good portion of the United States with uh, quality Alaskan salmon. And really, the, the population of uh, Alaska, most of it resides uh, right around through this area here. This is a common, the Kenai Peninsula is a common destination uh, for vacationers, uh, but a large portion of this is, is relatively unpopulated. Uh, if we were to zoom in on this area here, we'll get a little closer. Okay, you can see this is the Bering Strait, and the Kotzebue Sound is a body of water that leads to Kotzebue. So we'll, we'll go ahead and put in Kotzebue, Alaska right there, and we'll zoom in on it. And you can see uh, that is a bit of a peninsula coming out into the water. Kotzebue itself is about between 20 103,000 people, probably 95% uh, in Yupiat, uh, or uh, more inappropriately known as Eskimo, uh, although they'll sometimes refer to themselves as that. Um, but this is, uh, this is a larger town uh, for the area. There are really very few roads going into and out of Kotzebue, so most uh, big shipments come in by boat. Um, of course, the, the locals, uh, you know, will do some hunting and fishing uh, out through this area. Uh, but, but that is where we flew to, Kotzebue, from, uh, from Anchorage. So we'll zoom in on that a little bit more so you can kind of get a, a feeling of the town. There's not a lot here. Uh, you can see this is the airstrip, uh, precariously located between uh, two bodies of water off that sound. <clears throat> and and there's just not a lot uh, that's happening there. Um, the airport is right down here. The tarmac uh, that we sat at, uh, uh, the uh, the tent on the tarmac where we sat at, uh, was located right in here. Uh, breakfast was over here, and and most of what we did was uh, was quite a bit of walking. All right, now let's let's go to this crazy place, Feniac Lake. Uh, which is which is where we were located. You can see we're going up quite a ways. And Feniac is a good sized lake. As I recall, it's about uh, uh, seven miles long from end to end, a couple miles wide. There is a river uh, that comes out of Feniac that uh, is coming from, uh, I believe it's flowing, I believe it's flowing, if I remember right, it was flowing this direction. So it was flowing towards that north slope. So let's back off a little bit here so you can, you can see the mountain range. <clears throat> this is the Brooks Range Mountains. This is the northernmost mountain range in the world. And we're at the very top end of the Brooks Range. And uh, just a little further north of us, is where the Brooks Range ends and starts turning into the North Slope. Uh, flatland area, uh, very, very marshy and full of muskeg, things like that. And, uh, and, and, and that up to the edge of the ocean is where the oil drilling is done. 
But as we come back to uh, to and a little bit further, so you can get a sense of where we were camping. If it'll okay, so there was a nice gravel bar in this area down here, and that gravel bar was the. Uh, the, the very rough airstrip that uh, Matt Owen was able to fly us in on. And uh, right in here is where he flew us in and flew us out and we set up our tent and all our hunting base was out of this area. So just to get an idea, you know, it was... Uh, it was somewhere out in this area, I believe, that uh, Roger got his caribou. Uh, my caribou was taken out in this area, and Paul's caribou was taken over in what we called the cow pasture. He had to cross the river, which wasn't terribly deep, but uh, you, de you needed to have good, good boots on. Uh, but I believe he was somewhere over up in this area up in here to give you a sense of things. <clears throat> Feniac Lake uh, was a little bit more than 170 miles from Kotzebue. And, uh, and as we were told by Matt, we were at least 65 miles uh, from the nearest other. Quite remote. But a beautiful mountain range to the north of us. And to the... Uh, southeast of our tents is where the lake was. <clears throat> so this up here is all that north slope area. It even starts right up in here as well. But you can see, you know, that this this mountain range here is is the uh, is the northernmost edge of the Brooks Range. Lots of views down here. Quite a ways up. From here to here, uh, it wasn't a terribly long flight, uh, but from Kotzebue to Feniac Lake was a uh, two hour flight uh, via Matt's plane. So Matt brought me out first, Brent Anderson, uh, got me uh, set up, or set up camp. He flew back, back to get uh, Paul and Roger, uh, and then they came back and joined me. Hope this is helpful. We were fortunate when we landed in Kotzebue that, uh, one, I had a great relationship with uh, Matt and Julie Owen from Northern Air Trophy uh, in that uh, I had hunted with them before back in uh, 2005 and uh, help them with their website, that sort of thing, northernairtrophy.com, great place to go visit. But also it was great weather when we arrived. And so Matt was all caught up with the hunters he needed to take out to their location. And uh, we didn't have to wait long uh, at the uh, little tent on the tarmac uh, before we were taken out. As I mentioned in the Google Earth tour, uh, Matt brought me out first uh, with our gear and the number of people. Uh, he had to make two flights, uh, chose to bring me out first just based on my uh, experience with hunting out there and the terrain and, uh, and the equipment that they were using to, uh, to rent to us. And so I was taken out first, uh, just about a two-hour flight to get out. Uh, then he had a two hours to get back uh, to pick up uh, Matt, or I'm sorry, to pick up uh, Paul and, and Roger. And then, um, uh, and then fly them back. So I was going to be alone by myself for about five hours out there. Not, not that big of a deal. But um, as you'll see in just a few moments when we start to sc scroll through some of the images we took from the flight, uh, the, the, the flight out of Kotzebue up to Feniac was, was stunning. What we saw was absolutely beautiful. Uh, from the air, we saw moose. Uh, we saw grizzly bear. We saw doll sheep. Uh, we saw rivers, we saw land that likely hadn't been uh, walked across by mankind ever. 
um, absolutely beautiful. Uh, I personally felt that uh, that that flight and what we saw uh, was worth uh, every penny we spent on that trip. Absolutely spectacular. Here's a better understanding of the time of the year and the time we were hunting. So on September 1, Roger flies to Anchorage early to enjoy the city and have a little time to prepare for the adventure awaiting us. September 2nd, after a ride to the Hubert H. Humphrey Terminal by friend Rob Raleigh, Paul and Brent learn there's been some changes to the TSA regulations about locking gun cases. We didn't have a key to the case loaned to Brent by friend and firearm safety instructor Mark Bauer. After many panicky minutes of trying to find a nearby retailer, two helpful TSA agents were able to pick the locks closed, and we had plenty of time to catch our flight to Anchorage. We arrived near to the noon hour, and Roger met us with the shuttle from the Puffin Inn. We enjoyed a great lunch, reindeer au jus sandwich at Gwani's. September 3rd, additional struggles with the gun case, locks again at the airport in Anchorage but at that time I had the chance to meet famed Iditarod musher Martin Boozer. We arrived at Kotzebue at 7.30 a.m. and were met by Caleb Moore, uh, originally from Prairie de Sac, Wisconsin, who was helping Northern Air Trophy uh, as a taxidermist and uh, on-site helper. We had a great breakfast at the Bayside Hotel. Non-resident hunters are not allowed to take any game the first day they arrive to a destination but must wait until the following day before they can hunt so although we arrived to Feniac Lake Thursday September 3rd we could not begin hunting until Friday the 4th uh, when we got up uh, Roger and Paul went one direction towards the mountains and I went along the river this river we were told by Matt Owen from Northern Air Trophy contains uh, grayling and the Feniac Lake uh, contained uh, good lake trout, good sized lake trout, he said, 35 40 pounds. And so he did send us with some fishing gear and uh, asked us to hurry over and get some fishing licenses before we left. Uh, the first day, Roger and Paul went off one direction towards the mountains, and I went uh, out and along the river to scope that out. These are some of the shots that both Roger and I took uh, from that first morning. That very first morning of hunting, Roger took a very nice bull his first morning, Friday, September 4th, and he was joined on his stock by Paul. 
Uh, Roger chose this bull and used his new rifle to make a 235 yard shot at about 11.30 a.m. Uh, just so you start to know the size of the caribou antlers, that sort of thing, if one were to compare this to a whitetail, uh, this would be a, a smaller uh, six-point uh, whitetail, uh, whitetail buck. With Roger being done with his hunting on Friday, uh, that left the rest of his trip to take photographs, do a little bit of fishing, uh, help us as needed, uh, enjoy life around camp. We had beautiful weather, uh, 60 to 65 uh, daytime temperatures and nighttime temperatures that maybe went down to the low 40s. <clears throat> well, that following morning on Saturday the 5th, uh, Paul went off one direction. He wanted to cross the river and go to an area that we had uh, grown to call the the cow pasture, because there were always caribou in it, day and night, which left me with two two directions I could go. And uh, sadly, when I glassed those directions before heading that way, uh, I saw uh, grizzlies all around. So I decided to stay back in camp, enjoy the scenery. Uh, while I was glassing, uh, I did notice uh, a huge, huge bull moose uh, pass what I believed to be near near to Paul. Uh, Paul never got to see it, but I swear these antlers were, were 65 to 70 at least. Uh, this was definitely a trophy bull. We didn't have license, of course, to, to hunt moose. Uh, but Paul, um, had he seen it, uh, could have had some pretty good pictures, I would believe. But uh, it was a beautiful day, and I was able to uh, spot some, some cow caribou and some calves uh, coming up to us, and I snuck down and got some great pictures.
the further north you get of the Arctic Circle, <clears throat> the less likely there are to be large trees. In fact, where we were, there were no trees or shrubs or any kind of uh, greenery uh, that grew much taller than four feet. There was uh, some willow type brush uh, that Roger was able to uh, collect up uh, and we had a nice little little bonfire uh, uh, Saturday night after a, a beautiful day of hunting. Um, but as Roger was coming back with the uh, the firewood, uh, was when uh, I spotted a, a small group of uh, caribou kind of heading towards us. Uh, actually, what appeared to be on a path between our campsite and where Paul was, although they were all cow and calves. Uh, I thought maybe I can sneak up close and uh, and get some good pictures. And sure enough, I got I got very close. The closer they got, uh, the further I got down to the ground. I kind of curled up into a ball, like uh, pretending to be a big chubby boulder. And uh, and these caribou came closer and closer. The one female uh, seemed to be uh, more curious than anything. And uh, as a result, I got some beautiful beautiful photos. As beautiful as the weather was, it just seemed as though things couldn't remain the same, and we all felt as though our good fortunes were about to change. Today, Brent did not get near to any bulls, and Paul had a few bulls come close enough for a rifle, but nothing within range of his compound bow. We had grown very fond of Feniac Lake, and although not spoken aloud, the location had somehow attached itself to the very core of our being. The scenery was poetic, and the potential for every captured photo changed each moment. Early on Sunday morning, September 6th, about 2 a.m., the wind started to blow, rather hard. By 6.30 a.m., we had gale force winds, and the group was rousted from sleep by a collapsing aluminum pole structure that was being severely bent by 60-mile-per-hour winds that pounded against our rainfly and wanted to tear it from the stakes that held it and our tent into the ground. While there was some momentary panic about hurrying outside and doing our best, <clears throat> better senses caught up to us, and we realized that if we left the tent, likely we would lose the tent entirely to the wind and have that end up in the river. So we held on, stayed inside the tent, held it up, talked about various solutions, talked about one person going outside and deploying some of those solutions while the others stayed inside to keep the weight of the tent down so it didn't blow away. These winds that we had, we estimated were between 60 and 70 miles an hour. And although it had cooled off quite a bit outside, we hadn't realized quite so much until we tried to go outside uh, to go to the bathroom. It was so windy and so cold uh, that we, uh, uh, we, we went to the bathroom in a, a Nalgene water bottle and uh, poured it out the door. And uh, we didn't leave the tent until we had our plan in place as to what we were going to do to make sure the tent wasn't damaged further. This was our, our sole source of uh, protection and our, our primary uh, uh, need for survival, uh, to be able to stay out of that wind. Uh, we estimate again that the, the, the winds were between 60 and 70. We were pretty sure the temperature had dropped down to the mid-20s somewhere. You can do the math as to what the wind chill was like, but it was very uncomfortable to be outside for any length of time. Roger went out uh, about two hours later uh, uh, to remove the rain fly. 
uh, repound the stakes a little further into the ground and protect whatever seams he could uh, with some duct tape and some ingenuity. These winds stayed with us all day Sunday and all day Monday and only began to settle by Tuesday morning. There was no chance of any hunting. You couldn't see. Your eyes watered up. There was no cooking of food, so we ate what dried foods there were, what snacks there were. We even broke into a can of Dintymore stew that was nicely chilled and had uh, some congealed fat up and around the corner near the mouth. Uh, uh, we may do. Uh, Matt and Julie had sent some R&R &R Canadian whiskey with us. Uh, we told stories. We took naps. Uh, we convinced Paul to get engaged. He even had a, uh, a little ring from a spam can uh, that he was going to give to Luann, which uh, never quite materialized. But, you know, you talk big, you know, when you're out in the wilderness in a survival situation. But by Tuesday morning, the wind had settled down to 20 to 25 miles an hour although that temperature had not risen very much. Paul got up that morning and asked Roger to borrow his rifle. He left the tent at about 8 a.m. Not more than an hour and a half later, he returned. The tent was still shaking and flapping so badly we hadn't heard his shot. Uh, Brent was outside the tent and preparing to head out hunting on his own when Paul returned. He gave Brent a dumbfounded look and asked what kind of hunting partner would not even come out to help his buddy. Since Brent hadn't heard the shot, he asked Paul what happened, and Paul told the story. High fives. Paul had taken a, a, a nice bull at 130 yards, and had even gotten a few pictures. But he needed help getting the animal back across the river, about a one-mile carry. Roger did not have knee-high boots, and so they arranged to rig waterproofing with large garbage bags so Roger could cross and help him. Meanwhile, Brent went out hunting on his own. Roger and Paul went one direction toward his animal, and uh, while they were heading to the animal, more and more animals started to show up around them. So as you'll see through here, uh, they were able to get some fantastic pictures as they were taking picture of Paul with his trophy. Oh, the in, the, in whitetail equivalent, oh, about an eight or nine point buck, a good eight for sure. Uh, they had animals all around them and got some spectacular photos. <clears throat> In the meanwhile, uh, Brent uh, went off another direction, and some of those animals that were coming around Paul uh, had actually uh, stopped near to Brent. Ba Brent was able to put a, a stock on them and uh, uh, saw a nice bull, uh, had a cow uh, right in front of him uh, that was blocking the bull's view of, of Brent putting the stock on. Uh, finally, that uh, cow stood up and uh, the bull then spotted Brent and he had to take the shot. So while Paul uh, was field dressing his animal, uh, Brent got his own bull, similar size, um, and, and by doing a standing shot at 325 yards. Uh, a group of bulls and cows were uh, bunched together and as he uh, neared uh, the bulls, uh, all, all but one uh, uh, were taking off. Uh, the bull's vision of Brent was blocked by that curious cow uh, that was waiting to see if, if uh, Brent was any sort of threat. Here are some of those photos. After Brent had field dressed his caribou, he returned to camp uh, to uh, uh, check on uh, Paul and Roger's status uh, with the binoculars and saw that they were uh, returning across the river uh, with the animal quartered and uh, all packed up and ready to go back with them. Uh, as they were approaching camp, uh, Brent spotted uh, Matt Owen uh, flying over and he then laid out the blue tarp, which is a signal to the pilot that, uh, hey, yeah, we're, we're nearly done or we could use some help. Uh, it's not, not an emergency, but if you can come and, come and help us, uh, we could use you. So in less than ideal conditions, still because of the wind, uh, Matt flew in uh, early that afternoon and agreed to take uh, Roger back to Cat's View uh, with his animal and all his gear. Um, he was very doubtful about uh, being able to get back in and get Paul and Brent and all their gear and animals out the same day. Uh, so Paul left the, uh, I'm sorry, Matt left the uh, satellite phone with Brent uh, to check in with him the following morning then, uh, Wednesday morning. Uh, to see what the conditions were like and whether or not Brent believed that, uh, that he could get in. 
Uh, so <clears throat> Roger was able to head back to Cottsview, uh, get a nice shower, get some good food in him, and uh, Brent and Paul then uh, uh, stayed uh, at Fenniac, uh, just the two of them, uh, until the following day when Matt called early. Brent gave the conditions, and Matt decided to, uh, to make a go for it. Uh, again, based on the wind, the wind direction, the location of the runway, uh, Matt was uh, able to come in, and uh, he didn't believe he could get both of us out with that wind. Uh, he did note that uh, just a few miles away there was no wind, and it was nice, sunny, and warm. He thought it was very much a phenomenon, and why we had such harsh weather there uh, when just a few miles away it was beautiful. So he chose to take Paul out first, uh, bring him down to the No Attack River, drop him and his gear off there, uh, where Paul waited, Paul flew back, or Matt flew back and picked uh, Brent up and uh, got him back to the No Attack River where Paul was. Then uh, uh, we loaded up the gear, loaded up the animals carefully, and with a very, very, very short runway, uh, Matt was able to, uh, to take off. Um, had a little fun with uh, Paul in the process. Uh, you know, uh, Matt has, a, has a, a wicked sense of humor. And, uh, you know, although he knew the capabilities of his plane and the weight he was carrying, uh, he turned and looked at Paul and, and says, gosh, I don't know, this runway is pretty short. I'm not sure we can make it. You know, of course, you know, Paul has, you know, the fear of God in his eyes at that point in time. And uh, Matt revs the engine. You know, we, we take off with 10 feet to spare. And in Matt's world, that's, you know, 100 yards to spare. And as soon as we get off the ground, uh, Matt shouts out, my God, we made it. <laughs> Like he was surprised, and I th I thought Paul was going to uh, completely lose his mind at that point in time, uh, but down by the no attack was was a beautiful spot as as Matt had mentioned there was very little wind, uh, uh, it was sunny, uh, it was very warm, we were comfortable probably in short sleeve shirts, uh, but Paul did comment uh, that where he was left all alone. Uh, with uh, with not much other than his compound bow and his wits, uh, there were grizzly tracks uh, in the sand. So he he was very pleased when the plane was returning. Oh, so many stories to tell. They can't all fit in this video. We were back in Kotzebue by mid-afternoon. We showered, and Roger worked with Caleb Moore to prep our meat for a hurried flight back to Anchorage to catch the last Sun Country flight of the season to Minneapolis the next morning. Caleb took possession of our antlers and capes and helped us box the meat. The return to Anchorage was uneventful. After a late dinner, we crashed and we slept hard. One more very harried adventure at the airport with the locks on Brent's gun case, and we were on our way home. As I think about this trip, I don't believe any of the three of us had ever experienced that depth of beauty, relaxation, stress, and joy all in one trip. Uh, it weren't warranted uh, a story and a video such as this. Um, to the both of you, I say thank you, gentlemen. It was indeed a memorable pleasure.